Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the voice, sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God and among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> Phyllis is praising God for getting over COVID. That, you got it. Praise God. All right. <laughs> and it was nice to listen to how That's right. right day, so. All right, well, this is our fourth picnic worship in the park, and I realized that I had not uh, blessed you with any of my wonderful dad jokes in a while. So, so, um, aha, I see the boys laughing at the table already. You know how great my jokes are. Well, a favorite character of mine growing up uh, in literature was Winnie the Pooh. You guys know Winnie the Pooh? A.A. A. Milton's uh, beloved character. Well, one day, Christopher Robert. Piglet, Eeyore, Tigger, and Pooh were all down by the water enjoying a lovely picnic like we're about to have in just a bit. And everyone was eating heartily except for Pooh. So Christopher Robin asked, you silly old bear, this picnic was your idea. Why aren't you eating anything? Oh, that's simple, Pooh replied. I'm stuffed. No. All right. That's bad. That's why you only get one every couple of weeks, I guess. Uh, <laughs> we want you to come back. Well, today's Bible passage has us at the beginning of it all, the wonderful garden that God had created for the first man and for the first woman. God made this Eden for them to enjoy, and I will assume that there was plenty to eat. I mean, after all, God said, you may eat of any tree of the garden except for, well, except for that one, right? Okay. And that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't eat that fruit or you will die. 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 That's right. Well, the garden was a large one. I would assume the garden was larger than this park, but this tree was in the middle. This tree was in the middle. Man and woman. Now, calling a tree the knowledge of good and evil, would Adam and Eve have had any clue what evil was? No. 
No, there, there was no evil to that point. But they would know what they would know what good is because God is good. Amen? Amen. And all the time, God is good. That's right. So this knowledge that they're lacking is simply whatever knowledge comes from being apart from God. They have not experienced that up to this point. It's a little like a kid who doesn't really know much, you know, like kind of <laughs> toddler or pre-toddler stages, but knows enough to look to mom or dad, usually mom, to see if something is good or not. Can you put yourself back in, in those days, either experiencing it yourself as a little kid or, or observing it? And how do we communicate with our little ones when words and categories like bitter or poison or even yucky don't mean that much? What do we do? Well, we make faces, right? We, we do whatever we can to communicate to that little kiddo that, that you know, maybe the slug that our toddler has picked up is not going to make good eating, right? <laughs> Sometimes our revulsion gets, gets the point across to them. So this innocence that, that little children have is something like what Adam and Eve knew. So when the snake, that devil, Satan, shows up and says, did God really say that you couldn't eat whatever you wanted to in the garden? Eve does her best to relay what God had told her, right? Yes. Not unlike maybe a little kid knows, well, mom said don't do that, but they don't articulate it quite the same way. She says, he said we were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then she adds something we don't hear from God. Maybe she heard it from Adam. And we can't touch it or we'll die. That's an addition. God hadn't said anything about not touching the tree. This is likely the first example of biblical interpretation, you know, taking what God has said and trying to apply it to our lives. So when it comes to the thou shall nots, this sort of thing tends to, towards legalism. Don't eat the fruit turns into don't even touch. And then those things become taboo and tempting. And a big old garden with lots of stuff to eat, lots of great fruit, we find ourselves picnicking in the shade of the tree that we're not supposed to eat from. Amen? You know, what happened to that, well, don't even touch it or we'll die edition that we, that we have put out? You know, those warning cones around the tree. You see how this sort of thing tends to work out in our spirits? For years and years, I worked with kids and youth and still work with kids, but not so much with, with youth other than, than Bradley, <laughs> for the most part. Um, and most of these youth that I would talk to at some point or another would be curious about relationships and romantic boundaries. I will say that because we have some some young ones in our midst. Uh, but you can see where I'm leading with this. Young people asking the pastor, how far can we go before making God mad? <laughs> and they want to know where the line is. And I would never tell them where the line was. Because lines don't help us. Lines don't help us, do they? Rules, rules in general don't help us. We, you and I, we want to find out, maybe it's not that area of our life that we're too concerned about, but we want to know where the line is so that we can do what? Get as close as possible to the line, tippy-toe over the line for a quick little thrill and then jump back. That's how temptation works. Amen? As soon as somebody says, don't do it, what do we want to do? Right. Yeah. How dare you tell me not to do it? Knowledge of good and evil. So let's say this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's got fruit growing on it. Why would I want to know evil? Why would I want to know evil? Participate in it, indulge in it, play with it, talk about it. That's the knowing that, that the Bible talks about. In ancient Hebrew, 
It's an intimate association, that word means. It's why the King James translates the first verse of the very next chapter, Genesis 4.1, as Adam knew his wife Eve, and then she gave birth to a son. So the temptation was there because of the proximity that Adam and Eve had to the tree, the tree that God had told them not to eat from. They eat because they want to be like God. Has anybody here even thought just for a moment, I'd like to be God in this situation. I'd, I'd like things to turn out the way I want them to turn out. Or I wish I had the power to make things different. I just right? Want to know what's gonna I want to know what's going to happen. I want to know everything's going to be okay. I want to know my loved ones. Are gonna, you know, that sort of desire to be God-like is... That's not a bad, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. When Eve is tempted and, and the snake says, did God really say, right? And we hear that in our own minds, or maybe we hear it from somebody who's tempting us or a situation that's tempting us. It occurs to me, what could Eve have done in that moment if she was unclear about what God had really said? Who, who else is known to be in this garden from time to time? God is. God is, right? So she could say, you know what? I'm not really clear on that point. Let me ask the one who gave the instruction. But when we don't do that, we just say, well, I'm pretty sure this is what was said. And we have that, that overconfidence. That's when we get into trouble. That's when we get into trouble. So... They eat because they want to be like God. Their eyes are open, open to see the foolishness of what they've done now and how it's going to hurt God. Shame. Something that's never been experienced in their existence to this point comes into creation. Shame, that sense of something is wrong with me. That I am wrong. Not something I've done is wrong, but something with me is wrong. That's, that's not what God wants. Guilt, guilt is okay. Guilt prompts confession. If we know we are guilty of something and we confess, that's a good and healthy spiritual thing. Guilt prompts confession. Shame causes us to hide. So what did Adam and Eve do? They hid. They hid, sewing thick leaves together and hiding among some, some other trees in the garden. Presumably they're not dumb enough to hide in the tree that they just picked the fruit from. We would hope. But Maybe not, you know, those of us that have had little kids before. Oh, yeah. Sometimes they're they're there with with the evidence in their hand. Oh, no, I didn't do it, mommy. You know, yeah. we've seen those TikTok videos or YouTube where the kid is like covered in, you know, flour or something that they got on their mom's cupboard and they're I didn't do anything, right? Yeah. So I would be too surprised if Adam and Eve are hiding in the very tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Adam and Eve are found in their hiding place. And Adam mentions another feeling like guilt that had not been experienced in creation before breaking this trust with God, this original sin. That feeling was fear. It was fear. Adam and Eve were afraid of the loving God who had created everything for them and called them. And, and they called that creation very good. God's calling out to them, though clearly God knows where they are, and it shows that if that they have nothing to be afraid of. If God came storming into the garden and said, I know you screwed up, where are you? Then they would be right to be afraid, right? Yeah. But but how does he say it? He says, Where are you? And later, what is this thing that you have done? It's it's more coming from God's heart being broken knowing what they've lost and what they've introduced into their experience. So these aren't shaming questions. They're questions that call for repentance, for return, for reconciliation. When we experience our own failure to follow God's direction, yield to temptation, and sin ourselves, we have a similar choice before us. We can remember God's character as good and loving, or we can run from God, believing our shame more than God's truth. God's truth is seen over and over in Scripture in both his call through the prophets as well as direct message from, from his angelic messengers. So, so this, is, this, is brought, this sin is brought 
fear into the equation. What do those angelic encounters in the Bible after this point usually start out with? When an angel shows up to a human being, they start out saying, fear not, right? Fear not. So Adam's afraid. His response is fear. And ever since then, God has been saying to us, fear not. You don't have anything to be afraid of. That fear comes from inside, from our shame, from our sense that we've screwed up so bad that God couldn't possibly love us. Guess what? That's never going to be true. You can never screw up so bad that God doesn't love you. Fear not. And James writes in his letter, chapter 4, verse 18, he says, There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected by love. Now, you will surely die. Now that, they had no idea what that was, right? They didn't know what evil was. They didn't know what die was. So when God says, the day that you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. What? How, how would they know what that was? Nothing had died in creation yet. Yeah. Nothing had died in creation yet. So they know it's bad because God's told them not to do it, but they don't really have a concept of what that is. We know what that is, and we read our definition of it back into Scripture. It didn't sound good. That was likely their reason for fear, right? So Adam and Eve are hiding. They're afraid. He said we were going to die. I don't know what die means, <laughs> but it's going to happen. But just like a loving parent, our God makes a way for them that is grace-filled and provides an opportunity for their salvation. Death does come. Death does come, and it comes immediately, but not directly. I'll explain what I mean. A lot of people read Genesis 3 and they think, well, God told them that they were going to die, and then he didn't kill them. So God lied. Why should I trust him? Or this is an example of the Bible being so dumb, it doesn't realize it contradicts itself. Have you ever heard that? Or thought that? Or thought, like, well, he said they were going to die. They ate it. Like, our expectation would be crunch. As soon as they bite in the apple or whatever fruit it was, boom. Drop dead. Yeah. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Snow White and the Seven Dwarf style. That's right. That's right. All right. Bad apple. But this is an origin story. The story that establishes the meaning for terms like life and death and sin and such. You don't get to read your perception of these terms back into the story. If you're wise, you get your perception of these words from this story. If God is love and life and the source of creation, then death is the separation from this source, this love, this life. Rather than being primarily governed by the spirit that God breathed into the dust to make man, it means we're limited by the dust we're formed from. To define death by simply biological terms, especially in the reading of this foundational fundamental story is to totally miss the point, I think. Biological death is, is part of the definition of you will surely die. But, and biological death does occur, but I don't think that that's God's primary consideration. Biological death does occur. Did you catch it? Who died? Or should I say, what died? The animals that gave their skin. Yes. Something does die immediately as a result of their sin. Uh, okay. The animals from whom the skins came from that God fashioned clothing for them. God clothed them and a sacrifice was made. Blood was shed and a biological life was ended so that man and woman could be shown grace and mercy. In light of this knowledge, our gained uh, knowledge of, of good and evil, what are we called to do? What should our response be? Well, fortunately, the Bible tells us. We don't have to guess at it. 
if you want, if you have something to write with, you want to jot this down. It's a it's a great passage to come to you for this very reason. Romans 13 verses 8 through 14 is very helpful for showing us the way forward once we have this knowledge of good and evil. Starting at verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, all right, here's the shall nots that we have a tendency to legalize our way all around. Yes, Jerry? The address again, please, Chris. Romans 13, yes. verses 8 through 14. So verse 9, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime. Not in carousing and drunkenness. Not in sexual immorality and debauchery. Not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Do you hear that? Love is the fulfillment of the love, of the law, but not, not any love, and not love as we define it. Love is demonstrated just like it was in the garden after Adam and Eve's sin. Love shown through a sacrifice that would clothe us, to cover out over our sin and free us from shame. Jesus died just as those unspecified animals did in clothing Adam and Eve. If we want to avoid the error of sin and temptation, it's not about keeping a litany of do's and don'ts. Amen? Amen. That list will keep growing till the end of time. Because we're going to keep coming up with new ways <laughs> to traipse all over that boundary. It's not about do's and don'ts. Love is the fulfillment of the law. If we truly love, we put aside deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And more so, we clothe ourselves in who? Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ, like that passage says. And we live into God's intention for us every day. Let's pray. Lord God, I know that every time I am tempted to set some sort of arbitrary boundary because I think, well, I just... I need, you know what I need? I need more rules in my life. And if I have more rules or if I have somebody telling me what to do, then, then that's going to fix things. But it, it doesn't really. But a funny thing, Lord, when I, when I spend more time with you, when I work on that communication and prayer, maybe listening to worship music, just spending time in your word, when I work on the things that, that build that loving relationship, then those temptations seem a little less tempting. Help us not to picnic in the shade of the tree that we know we're not supposed to eat the fruit from. Help us to have the good sense to, to get as far away from that by chasing after you, not chasing after something we think is going to make us happy. Chase after something we know is going to make us happy and fulfill. We thank you for being in this time of worship. We pray your blessings upon the gifts that, that people have given to make this possible. Thank you for those that are preparing the food even now before us. Thank you for the fellowship, the opportunity we have to, to spend some time together. And we thank you, Lord, for this communion meal that we're going to wrap up our time with. That acknowledgement, that blood was shed, a life was given. But when we sin, we don't die immediately, but something dies, someone dies. You have died to cover that sin for us. Help us to have the good sense to claim that for ourselves. That as we recognize this meal shared in your spirit, that we are reminded 
but there's nothing we could have possibly done this last week, this last month, our whole lifetime that would separate us from your love. Help us to recognize your love for us and then to walk in the way of love towards one another and towards you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.